want to welcome all of you to our service of worship this morning, and we have visitors with you, with us, and we give all of you a warm uh, summertime welcome. Uh, several announcements. Uh, today is Gideon Sunday, and our speaker, Mike Wright, will be sharing with us a little bit later. At the close of the service, uh, whether you can go out this way or out this way, you can't go out this way anymore. Uh, not today, anyway. Uh, there'll be ushers uh, with uh, a basket, and we invite you to share generously uh, an offering for the Gideon ministry. If you do that, and you can do that by check as well as cash, but if you're making the check out, you'll make it out to First UMC. Uh, you'll get credit for that, and it will send to Gideon uh, Ministry, Gideon International, uh, one check from the congregation. Okay. Just a reminder that between Mother's Day and Father's Day, we are doing a little fundraiser for uh, Promise Ministry in working with uh, uh, new moms. And so a bottle is in the narthex, and there's some up here, and in the educational hall. And we're collecting right up till Father's Day. Also, uh, Christina wanted us to indicate our interest for June 14th. As she shared last Sunday, they are doing some fundraisers for the children's ministry team to be able to go to a children's conference. And so, I'm, Jamie, if you'll help us, we'll just pass these down through the aisles. And so you can indicate your interest. Also, uh, this is a... a uh, Sunday in which we invite you to, to share a lot of different ways. Uh, last Sunday, I shared with you uh, that we are in the process of sharing a love offering for the annual conference. This year it goes to the African University in, uh, is it Mozambique? I can't remember. Anyway, I wanted to share just a word or two uh, to you this morning concerning that offering from uh, your bishop, James Swanson Sr. And he starts the letter by talking about so many young people in our country uh, seem to be void of any hope, whether it's from poverty, drugs, whatever. Uh, and he, he writes about that hope. He said, I've been to African University and I've seen hope in the eyes of young men and women who study there. Hope for themselves, hope for their families, and hope for, the, for their nations from which they come. Many of these young people have walked more than 200 miles to attend this beacon of hope. I visited the dormitories where they volunteered to give up space so one more student could lodge in that room with them. There is often not enough space for the students who flock there, only to discover that their hope is not in vain. The opportunity to attend a university like this is an opportunity not only to lift up a person, but an opportunity to lift up a family, an opportunity to lift up a community, an opportunity to lift up a nation, and ultimately an opportunity to lift up uh, the world. And so we invite you to share. Uh, we'll be taking uh, this uh, love offering with us uh, this week. Although if you didn't come prepared to share uh, an offering with the annual conference for African University, uh, you can do that over the next two or three weeks and we'll send that offering in. Again, if you're uh, paying by check or sharing by check, make it out to First United Methodist Church and uh, our rep, uh, Dewey Lane, Dr. Dewey Lane and Joe Fu will uh, bring our offering uh, with them as they come Wednesday for annual conference. We have some beautiful flowers here. Uh, Joe and Debbie Fu uh, are sharing again with us this week and this is in honor of Jamie Foster. Birthday. 40th birthday. 40th? <laughs> You're just a child. You're just a child. Come share with us. I know you have a <laughs> Yeah, Mike Bishop told me a lot of things change at 40. Yeah, they do. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. The youth are about a week and two days out from our youth trip. We are headed to Chattanooga, Tennessee to Lookout Mountain, Georgia. We'll be on top of Lookout Mountain uh, at Covenant College. Uh, we got our mission project. We are working with a boys and girls outreach in the city of Chattanooga uh, for three days. And uh, their ages go all the way from, I think, five all the way to 10, 11. So uh, I've recruited Christina to help me know how to plan for impact there. Um, but anyway, I just ask that you lift us up in prayer. Um, for some of our youth, we have a really young youth group. This is the first time they'll be serving or, or doing anything in this capacity. And uh, I think it's awesome. And we're going to have a great time. And just lift us up in prayer. Uh, we do have some scholarship uh, spots available if you feel like you'd like to donate to that. But uh, we love you guys, and we're looking forward to uh, going and serving uh, this, these kids in this ministry. Tell us the dates again. June 9th through the 13th. So, Very good. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, I'm excited about the youth. Not only going on a trip, but going on a mission trip. What a wonderful way to help them understand uh, the responsibilities that they have and will have as Christians. We appreciate that. Okay. Any any other announcements? Terry, would you open this with prayer, please? Father, what a glorious day you've given us together here in your house and in your name. Lord, we open our hearts and welcome your Holy Spirit to enliven us, to quicken our hearts as we hear the word proclaimed in the witness of your spirit with our spirit. Bless each one that, that participates in the worship this morning. We especially give thanks for our Gideon speaker. Now, Lord, we offer ourselves to you anew. Have your way with us today. Amen. Thank you to uh, Sherry. Uh, those of you who participated in our heritage time during the Sunday school, uh, this was all her idea. And she used, of course, Paul and the Rockaby, uh, Dee and Jack and others uh, to come in and, and get ready to serve us. Uh, David Dugas, I, I don't think David rode the horse very far, but <laughs> he was at least on the horse. But it, this is a, a wonderful opportunity for all of us. I'm sure you would agree if you were present to learn more about who we are as United <coughs> Methodists. And Sherry, we thank you for the, all the hard work that you You're welcome. Here. It's still set up in the gym on your way out. If you'll just take a glance through and take a walk down the history of our church. We're continuing that emphasis that we had this morning on the Wesleyan heritage of our denomination in this church here. All of the hymns that are chosen that we're going to sing this morning at the congregation were all written by Charles Wesley, brother to John, and with John, both of them sons of Father Samuel. Um, so when we speak of hymns written by Charles Wesley, we don't mean the music. The music that we sing these hymns to is all written to people mostly who came a hundred years after them. More modern music, you know, uh, from the 19th century. But um, so when we sing these hymns that we're singing by his, we mean the lyrics, the poetry. Uh, they would write, uh, he wrote over 6,000 different hymns. Uh, we talk about being, uh, writing a lot of poetry, over 6,000. And in our hymn, we have 48 of them, which is very impressive for having that many by one writer in our hymn. We're starting off with three of them, please. We invite you to stand, join with us, and we'll sing selected stanzas from all three of our opening hymns. This first one is sung every year at conference, annual conference. And it's wonderful. I like the words for what they said. We come back together to worship again on Sunday morning. Miss Virginia? Oh, 
our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
who referred me and then called me up and asked me to put together a bell ringing choir to play in the closing worship service. So I put together a choir of our ringers, um, two from Tazewell Springs, four from East Lawn, and the whole choir from Picayune, United Methodist Church. And we are going up there this Friday um, and staying overnight and rehearsing at 7 in the morning and then playing at the closing worship service. We're playing a solo for a prelude and then we're playing on the closing hymn along with organ and piano. So this is apparently we're making history of being first time handbells have been at the Mississippi <coughs> Conference. And we're excited. <laughs> And I, I especially think it's nice that Sherry volunteered to buy all of your supper on Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> and so, the, the name of this choir is the Seashore District Festival Ringers. And I thought it would be something that the district superintendent could be proud of. <laughs> I want to invite the children and Sherry and all those others that might be coming yeah. to come down this time. It's nice to have you and Davis with us this morning. Look at the smile. Yeah, yeah. I want to tell y'all a story, if I might. Uh, it's a story about a young man who was, uh, we would call him a farmer today. And he lived in Israel, which is a nation that Jesus uh, came from. And uh, uh, during his day, there were some bad folks. He had some bad neighbors. And uh, they all came from the Ike family. And uh, they wouldn't leave the nation of Israel alone. They, were, they would attack them at night. and They'd kill their cattle and sheep and rob their uh, crops. It was just a bad, bad time. And uh, there was a young man by the name of, of Gideon. Can you say Gideon? Gideon. Gideon. Let's try that one more time. Gideon. Gideon. Way to go. That's good. That's pretty good. Okay. And uh, God sent an angel to Gideon, and uh, he told Gideon that God had prepared for him to be a mighty warrior and that God would help him defeat these uh, bad next-door neighbors. And uh, these next door neighbors numbered in the thousands. And Gideon just couldn't understand how God would choose him or how God would use him to uh, rid these bad next door neighbors. And, uh, but he did. And as the story goes on, Gideon uh, assembled a, a, a pretty large army. Of folks, and God told Gideon, He said, Gideon, you got too many men. And he was already outnumbered a hundred to one. And the Midianites had 300,000 soldiers, if I remember the story. And after God got through with Gideon and sending some of his troops home, they only had 300. Have you ever done anything that you thought was impossible to do? If you had you, you will, you will. And I want you to remember Gideon because Gideon didn't think there was any way possible for him and this small band of 300 men to defeat this large army. God had a a way to do it. 
And so Gideon listened to God. He believed that God had the power to defeat this large uh, mass of bad neighbors. And the story says that these 300 men went with a trumpet. Y'all know what a trumpet is? With a trumpet in one hand and a glass in the other. And when they circled the camp, they blew the trumpet and they broke the glass and they held up torches. And this army just in confusion started fighting each other and they killed all themselves. God has a way of taking care of our problems. May not always be the way we think that he should, but it's always the right way. And as you grow, I want you to know that God is with you. He's right here with us today. He's always going to be with you, just like he was for Gideon. And he has something, I believe, special for all of you to do uh, as a way of serving him. Don't forget about Gideon. He's a wonderful person that we meet in the Old Testament. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you uh, not only for your servant Gideon, but for your servants uh, in the modern day Gideon ministry. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for your continuing presence in our lives. Lord, as we all grow in faith, help us to be faithful in teaching our children how much you love them, that you're always with them, that you have a perfect plan for their lives. And we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, but now we're still in school. We did like a um, project where I put on um, different kinds of paintings. And I was in fifth grade. Oh, you were? Well, wonderful. That's great. I hope one day you get to go to Israel, okay? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Brother Jim and children. We have now invite our ushers to come forward as we give of our tithes and our offerings. Lord, you have blessed us with many blessings. We thank you for the gifts that we are about to give and for the ministry to receive, that you would bless it to multiply your kingdom, that your word may go forth. For it's in your honor and your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>
this opportunity now to spend time in prayer. We do want to be mindful of uh, the Whitley family as um, in the loss of Cindy's mother, Mary Phillips. Uh, the funeral was Friday. Uh, also, I got word from Christina um, from Kelly Holter, a friend of hers and someone who has been a part of our children's ministry here at Times Helping, lost her mother to a car accident last night. Uh, Kelly Holter, uh, that family will please be in prayer for them. Also, let's continue to remember Ralph Griffin. Are there others that are forefront on our minds and hearts this morning? Mary Alice Richards, the Fontaine family. Henderson Raspberry. Okay, Dr. Williamson, Teresa Williamson, many of you know, is facing surgery as well. Let's take these moments now to lift up the concerns, the, those that we've mentioned and those that are listed in our bulletin, and perhaps there's others that are unspoken this morning. This is a time to call upon our Lord as we pray together. Gracious Father, we give you thanks for this opportunity for your people to gather in your house, to gather with a heart of worship, to praise you and to learn from you. Lord, we thank you for the gift of prayer that you have given us so that we may communicate and have a direct line to you with our hearts, concerns, our hopes and our desires and dreams. Lord, there's a number that we are lifting in prayer this morning as we look over the prayer concerns that are listed and those that we have named. Lord, we trust in a God who knows all things. And we pray that you would, uh, with your spirit, draw each one closer to you in their time of distress. That we would call upon your name as our hope. That you would be the one that we put our trust in. Lord, we lift up uh, the concerns of all our churches as we gather that we may truly be the city the light on a hill. That your message will go forth. We thank you for uh, the Gideons that are here with us today and, and how the word goes forth through them, whether it's in the jails or the churches or the hospitals or the hotels. Wherever it, the door is open, Lord, they're there to place the word, the living word of God. Thank you for the treasure that you have given to us to guide us and to show us your way. Lord, we need that word for this nation today, for this world. We have strayed far from your plans for us. Lord, oh, that we would uh, return to you and seek your face and seek to walk in obedience to what you have for us. We pray for those who are suffering today and in 
areas of persecution where they have taken a stand for their faith. And Lord, we pray for your grace and mercy, for your hope to be in their hearts in spite of the circumstances. Lord, we need you more than ever. We need your Holy Spirit to awaken men's hearts today, to draw us to yourself as the disciples walked with you and yearned to learn from you, you taught them this prayer that we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I give thanks for... First United Methodist Church here in Pastor Gula for your continued support of the Gideon ministry. You have been a longtime partner in that ministry. Uh, I, uh, when I was in the hospital last fall, uh, I asked one of the nurses, I said, if you would open that top drawer, there would be a Bible in there. And uh, she did. She said, oh, we have Gideon Bibles uh, in all of our rooms here at Providence, and uh, uh, Madge would take uh, those, that scripture and share with me almost each evening, and I know that was a part of my healing as well as your prayers undergirding me as well. This morning, we are delighted to have Mr. Mike Wright, uh, who is from Hurley, and uh, he is our speaker this morning. Uh, he heads up the church ministry part of that ministry. Uh, he is from Moss Point and uh, a graduate from Moss Point High School. He is also retired from Chevron and is now in business for himself. He is married to the Allison Hammond Wright. Some of you might remember uh, uh, Leon and Joyce Hammond who were a long time members at Creo and now a part of the Casper Springs uh, community of faith. And that's where Mike and Allison and their family also worship. Uh, one thing that uh, Mike uh, shared with me that Allison every day reminds him that he's the luckiest man in the world because he's married to her. And Mike, uh, as you sent that to me, I, I just pulled back from the chair and I thought, you know, Lord, I need to remind my wife of that same thing. <laughs> but we welcome you and our other Gideons who are with us and uh, come share. And if you will also introduce uh, the other Gideons that are here with us. Welcome to First United Methodist. So happy to be with you today. Ronnie, would you introduce our guest for the Gideons today? God bless you guys for coming. Would you pray with me? Father, as we gather in your house today, we are so humbled by this day, Lord. A great man is moving on to another job, Lord. We're so thankful for his support of the Gideon ministry and his support of this church and the members here as they support him, Lord. God, we just pray that you bless him, his wife, and as they move on to other things, Lord. We know they're not moving far because they've got you on their heart, Lord, doing what you would have them do, what you would have them be. Lord, we just pray for this day. 
God, that the words that would come from my mouth would come from you. Lord, you know I've prepared something to say, but it would be okay with me if your Holy Spirit would take over. Say what needs to be said. Touch hearts. Lord, more than anything, you know I've prayed that this day someone would be touched to have a greater appreciation for your precious word. We thank you for this day, and we pray your blessings upon it. In thy name we pray. Amen. These commandments I give you today should be upon your heart. You should impress them to your children. You should talk about them when you're in your houses, when you lie down, and when you get up. Said so you should write them on the door frames of your houses. And you should write them on the gates. So attach them to your hand. Maybe even put them on your forehead. Now that's a paraphrase, but that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Do you get the impression that those words were important? What would happen if you went home and you started writing on your gates or on your door frames? They would probably kick you out of the neighborhood. But you know what? It's time for the church of the living God to take more concern for God's covenant than man's covenant. So the first thing I said was probably the easiest part. They should be upon your heart. I want to encourage you. This is the best book that's ever been written. Not, is, not only is it the number one seller, it is the one that changes lives. It is the one that can turn your life around and make something out of nothing. Moses said another thing. Chapter 8, verse 3, he said, man should not live by bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus quoted him in Luke 4, 4 on that one. This is to be our bread. And you know, if you're like me, you haven't been in church very long, especially when it gets around 11.30 or 12 o'clock, and the first thing you're thinking about, where are you going to eat dinner? If you're listening, you're eating dinner. This is your word. This is your life. He said it again in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7. He said, these are not idle words I give you today, but this is your life. If you are a Christian and you are walking with God, this is your life. And how you treat this Word of God is a direct relationship as to your Christian walk. If you read it every day, if you're in it every day, you become to love it, do you not? You become to look for it. You look for it in the hospital. You look for it in other places. When you go to the doctor's office, we put them there. We make sure that this Bible is everywhere it needs to be as much as we can afford. But sometimes, there, there are Bibles sitting in warehouses now. There, there are people asking for them internationally. We can't get them there. We can't get the postage. But you people, you people have helped so much over the years, and your pastor has been such a great support. Let me tell you a little story about how you felt. I was at Clark Bayou oh, several weeks ago. Had finished up, was turning, the, turning things back over to the pastor. And this little lady stood up and she said, could I say something about the Gideons? She said, you know, she said 30 years ago, I was married to a drunk. She said, I left him drunk across the bed. I got in my car. And I drove to CVS. I was going to get whatever it took to get me out of this life. She said, after that, I went to King's Inn. Kind of close to home, isn't it? I checked in. For some reason, I looked in that little drawer before I took those pills. She said, there it was. God's Word. She said, I didn't even have to read it. 
one look at it, and I knew I could not do what I had come there to do. The power of this book is unreal. It is sharper. It is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, dividing asunder both soul and spirit, and bone and marrow. And it judges the attitude of the heart. What book can say that it does that? Only God's book. You know, Brother Bob told me the other day, he said, you know, we had a donor here that gave a thousand Bibles. And you know, as he was telling me that, I thought, there's somebody that believes in God's book, that believes that this book in the hands of someone who needs him will change their life. I love what Joshua 1.8 says. You know, Joshua wrote 24 chapters, but he said it right off in verse, chapter 1, verse 8. Do not let this book of laws depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it. And then you will prosper and be successful. David Jeremiah says that word successful shows up in the Bible one time, Brother Jim. And I just told you where it was. What is success? God defines success. But I can tell you one thing, it's not. It's not money. I have come to believe that joy and peace has more to do with God's success than anything else. David said in 2 Samuel 22 and 31, he said it again in one of the Psalms, 18 and 30. As for God, His way is perfect. And the word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield of all who take refuge in Him. God's way is perfect. And the word of the Lord is flawless. And you don't have to read this Bible very many times to realize that God is serious about His Word. As you think back about what I said in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you think about, you're supposed to talk about His Word when you're in the house or when you're walking down the road, when you're lying down or when you get up. Well, that pretty much covers everything, does it not? Sometimes we, we tend to let this gather dust. And we do not realize that this is our life. This is what instructs our life. This is the difference between success and failure as a Christian. You cannot live a power-filled Christian life without having this Bible at the forefront of your life. Now that's what we do. Here a few weeks ago, we were at a meeting with Gideons. And we had a guy there that was uh, leading us in music. Very articulate man. Just talented. I never can do that kind of stuff, so I, I'm just mesmerized by somebody that can. But as he sung, I thought, man, this guy must be a music director at a local church. Uh, don't know exactly what he does, but... He sure is articulate. Then he gave his testimony. He said, you know, I've been to the big house. Man, I was floored. I said, this, man, this guy's been to prison. He said, I spent 13 years there. He said, they gave me a 20-year sentence. He said, I was a bad dude. He said, I deserved everything they gave me. He said, I never will forget my first night in prison. He said, they not brought me any of my personal possessions. So the only thing that was in that room was a bed, a commode, and a little metal box. He said, the curiosity got the best of me. Had to open that metal box. What was in that metal box? One Gideon Bible. He said, I didn't get saved that night. He said, that started the road for me. I realized... There was somebody out there who cared about me. 
The Gideons came to the prison and shared the gospel with him. He said, now I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. One Bible in the right place at the right time. The power of God. Moving out of the Old Testament into the New. What did Jesus say about his word? Heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will never pass away. He said that in Matthew. And he was quoted saying it again in Mark. So what does that mean to us? Do you believe that you can take God's work from this life to the next life? Why not? If you remember it here, why should you forget it there? Because God said, Jesus said, His word will never pass away. And God was so intent on helping us understand about the Word of God that He called Jesus the Word. <coughs> you remember that. In John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then He goes on in verse 14, and He says, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld the glory, the glory of the one and only from the Father in grace and truth. Wouldn't it be something to have seen Jesus in the flesh? Somebody said something the other day. I listened to it on the radio and I thought, my goodness, I believe that's true. He said, His Word is the same as His presence. His Word is the same as His present when you read this book and you understand what He has given us. It's the same as His presence. I love when Jesus was praying for you and for me. In John chapter 17, He said, Sanctify them by your truth. And what is the truth? Your Word is the truth. Our sanctification comes through the Word of God. Folks, I can't tell you how much this, this Bible, these words have meant to me. I've been a Christian for a long time. But in the last five or six years, I had determined that I'm going to read this Bible every day. I start my days out with it. And I read and I study. And I can't tell you the peace and the joy that it brings to my heart. Scriptures, like Psalms 103.19, For the Lord has established His throne in heaven, and His kingdom rules over all. You know, when we look at the situation around us, we think, oh my, this is coming to an end and coming pretty quick. We see what man does. Let me tell you, this Bible will show you what God does. And He has control over it all. Nothing surprises Him. And if that doesn't give you peace, if that doesn't start your crank, you might didn't check your starter. You got a little trouble there. Listen, guys. The Word of God is the most powerful thing you can have in your life. You can't talk about the Word of God without mentioning 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is God-breathed. This is all God-breathed. Useful for teaching, correcting, and rebuking, and training in righteousness. Why? So that the godly man might be fully equipped for every good work. This is our equipment. Don't go off without your equipment. Keep in this Word. And let me tell you something. If you'll stay with it, it'll get in your heart. Now you can't go home today and read a chapter and think, okay, this is going to change my life. It might. But if you keep reading and you keep reading and you keep reading and you, time after time and you finish it and you go back and you read it again, then all of a sudden you realize you wake up one day, you know what, that makes sense. This thing is starting to come together for me. And then, 
you'll feel a little bit of sprout joy in your heart. Then you'll understand what I'm, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about peace. Now, I'm telling you this from a personal standpoint. It works. I have never seen a promise yet that God has not kept. He keeps them all. It's true from Genesis to Revelations. In Revelations, and I'm finishing we hear about the Word of God one more time. We talked about it in Deuteronomy. We brought it all the way to, to the end of the book. In chapter 19, John the Revelator. He stands up and he says, I saw heaven standing open. And there was a horse, a white horse. And his rider was called Faithful and True. And with justice, he does judge and make war. Let me tell you, our Lord is coming back. And he's not coming back as a sheep to the slaughter. He's coming back as Lord of the Lord and King of Kings. John said, and his eyes were as blazing fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written on him that no one knew but himself. He was clothed in a robe and it was dipped in blood. And his name was the Word of God. The Word of God. Jesus Christ, our Savior, so did the will of God that there was nothing else, Brother Jim, but the calling, but the Word. He was the Word, and He is the Word. Let that Word invade your life. Let that Word change your hearts. Live in this Word, and you will never regret it. Thank you. Thank you all for what you do for Jesus and the Gideon ministry. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Brother Jim, for your support over the years. We love you, and we're praying for you. You know we are. God bless you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mike, so much. I've had an opportunity this week to uh, Think back uh, many years ago, back to 1985 and 86, I was, I, I shared this with you before. I was involved in prison ministry at Parchman. And uh, the, the week before we were to leave to go to North Carolina, uh, I was there on a Friday night and I was gathered with some 400 prison inmates. And I had already seen it before, but uh, I noticed every inmate had a Bible. And every Bible that they carried was from the Gideon ministry. 400 men. Most of those men came to know Jesus Christ there in the confines of prison uh, because of people like you, Mike, and the Gideons, uh, we do appreciate your ministry. Y'all you, keep on. Uh, you are a, a part of the church's ministry, a vital part of the church's ministry, and especially God's ministry. We appreciate all the work that you do. Then, uh, as uh, we conclude our worship service, you'll be invited to, to share an offering. Uh, the ushers uh, will be at each entrance. And uh, we hope that you will do so in a generous way. Dr. Foss? Let's rise and sing a hymn of going forth, a hymn of closing. Forth in thy name, O Lord. <laughs>
Now I invite you to join hands as we sing Shalom, God's peace to one another, as we continue to go out from the church and be involved in this ministry.